So Channel 4 gave me the money to do an interview with Keith just to see if it was going to work. So I arrived with a film crew uh, in the middle of winter at Keith's house. We drove for miles along to get to his house. And the first thing that happened was the, um, the van of the film crew skidded and went into a ditch. So we had to spend the first hour <laughs> chatting away to Keith whilst uh, something came along to tow it out. And then I said to Keith, well, where are we going to do it? And I said, well, you know, in his studio there are three grand pianos. I said, Let, why don't we just do it by piano in case you want to play the piano at all? He said, I'm not a performing monkey, Mike. <laughs> uh, um, all right, I said, I don't mind. Keith, where would you like to do it? And he suggested a study where he um, liked talking. And he said, but I want to do it standing up. And I thought that was very odd. Um, and then the cameraman came up to shake his hand. And, and um, no, Keith came up to talk to the cameraman, shake his hand. And the cameraman said, I've got a cold. And he said, you got a cold? Roseanne, <laughs> cameraman got a cold. I don't think we should do it. And I'd come all this way, and I'd come <laughs> flown to New York, got and picked up the crew, arrived at his house. And he sent Roseanne out to the local pharmacy to buy, of course, what we're all now wearing, <laughs> which is masks, but it was rather <laughs> alien. So first of all, the cameraman had to wear a mask throughout the whole interview. Uh, and then he decided he wanted to do it standing up. And I said, well, I think strange. So we lit it for him standing up. And as soon as he started filming, he sat down. And I thought, this is going to be a disaster, really. But the extraordinary thing was, and I've realized that this was actually slightly the way that Keith worked, was creating drama and chaos before things. And of course, the most famous incident is the Köln concert, where he almost pulled out of it altogether because he didn't like the piano and he didn't uh, and then he did, of course, record the concert, which has been the best-selling concert anywhere. Um, and then he just talked. And he fielded all my questions, always with my friend Ian standing next to me. But Ian, by that time, had got his, his gradual dementia. And so he couldn't really participate. But his presence, I think, gave uh, Keith respect that he actually had to do something serious. Um, and he talked beautifully. And uh, we came back, and on the basis of that long conversation, at the end of the day, even, he said, you know, Mike, I enjoyed that. <laughs> Should we continue tomorrow? And I said, well, we're going off to... He said, but I could only do it in the afternoon. And I said, well, Keith, we can't, because we've... I've got this film crew, with. they've got to get back to New York. So even though he... Uh, appeared to say he wanted to do it tomorrow, he'd have to choose a time which was inconvenient, and in fact, we never did any more filming. And I never was able to get any more conversation with him in all the other places we met. He never said in, oh no, we did brief conversation in which he was said nothing but negative things about people and stuff, <laughs> and I just junked it. It was extraordinary. But on the basis of the interview, that's the, that's the core of the whole thing. But now, and I saw it, and. Although it was made in 2005 for Channel 4 in England, uh, because Keith has now had two strokes and can't play anymore, so it's a terribly sad situation, uh, we decided to relicense the film because it has a certain period of licensing. And so the BBC picked it up and showed it last Friday uh, on, on, um, on the BBC last Friday. So it's had a new lease of life, uh, which is terrific. Um, uh, but I must say, when I was watching it, I watched it with tears in my eyes because I thought of Keith, unable to play, and about five or six of the musicians in the film have since died since I made it. And they're all wonderful, so I hope you have a great night. And it's not because it's me, because they're good. Thank you for coming. Thank you. As you told us at the beginning, so this, in a, in a way, this uh, the way uh, this documentary is, is a, a bit like you're approaching, so the, the, the um, doing uh, the documentaries as a process, uh, where uh, you are um, 
able to include unexpected things, overcome difficulties, uh, and uh, uh, connect things that uh, at uh, first look might not have a connection in addition. Well, I think I was very lucky that there's some wonderful, wonderful archive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's some, so, so terrific to find mm -hmm. the perfect archive material from various stages of his career. And also, as I was able to, um, I mean, Chick Corea was at the Festival Hall. So I arranged to meet him for half an hour after a concert he did. Mm -hmm. And I went on the way to buy a TV which could actually play the cassette <laughs> of the doctor. And so I took the TV along and, and he listened to it for the first time since he played it. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of fantastic, really. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I managed to get, uh, excuse me, I've got it in a mint. Um, mm -hmm. Charlie Hayden was in Paris. And so I jumped onto Eurostar mm -hmm. and met him in Paris. And we arranged a time and he was very, very late. And I thought, oh God, it's not going to work because my return <laughs> ticket was coming up. And then he came and he was beautiful, absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, and so these chance encounters mm -hmm. and, you know, going to Sweden to talk to those mm -hmm. two beautiful Jan and Palla. You know, they're beautiful and they just said something so perfectly. Mm -hmm. And then to find the archive material which completely sustained every single moment. Um, and I think, you know, the sadness is that one, I can't remember whether it's Palla or Jan has died. And Charlie's died, and Dewey's died, and Chick has died. You know, it's terribly sad when they're such great musicians and lovely people. And they seem to bring something out in Keith, which was fantastic, because he talked about them with such warmth. And, um, and I think that American quartet, when you see Keith, you know, he plays every instrument, and he plays it brilliantly. I mean, just a, for yeah. me, in a funny way, I think that's almost musically the most magical because there seemed to be such a sort of openness mm -hmm. and there's so many different el levels of music coming together. And I think the people who filmed those things are just really good. Mm -hmm. You know, so much now you have all those fixed cameras all over the music and you just feel somebody just flicking buttons from camera to, from shot to shot. And yet in these sequences you feel the cameraman was really listening, really exploring the space and the and the relationship between the musicians. And it doesn't matter if the camera isn't on the musician who's playing. If they're playing with somebody else, that person is responding to that music. So everything is relevant. And you can often find people to be so desperately obsessive to get on the soloist. Mm -hmm. And in fact, why be on the soloist? Why not just be on the drummer if they're really responding to that solo? I mean, that's perfect. And uh, so it was a question of finding a way of blending all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And Keith had something to say interesting about everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, we didn't touch a topic which he didn't have an insight about. Mm -hmm. uh, and was smiling and warm and mm -hmm. interested. There was no moment when he, you felt him thinking, oh God, mm -hmm. who's this guy asking me this silly question? It just didn't have that feeling at all. And which his, was magical and surprising to me. His relationship with Manfred Asher yeah. It's, um, but Kit never mentions Manfred Asher, or does he? He does, at the beginning. He does, at the beginning. He said we found a relationship and we respected each other. And because it was very important for him. Yes. But for instance, that concert where you see Manfred recording it, the idea is that we were going to, I was going to film a bit of it, and arrived and the atmosphere was terrible. Nobody's talking to each other. There's terrible tension. And Manfred said, look, Mike, don't even think the filming. Just come where I'm, where I'm recording. And there we are. You know, something goes wrong and then something really goes right because we had the concert on that fixed screen mm -hmm. and we had Manfred and you really felt Manfred listening to it. I mean, and, and it was just yeah. perfect. And so um, it was much, much better and more interesting than having filmed the concert. Mm -hmm. You got another level. Mm 
And that was, so there was so, lots of chance things happen. And I think it's a question of always looking for those chance moments. Uh, and the other thing that technically um, I found interesting, for the first time you could inlay people talking whilst you're hearing the music, uh, instead of just having the voice over. And that seemed to me to be wonderful because it sort of, you know, when Keith came in framed by the music he was talking about, somehow it was animated in a way that if you just heard the voice, you wouldn't have heard it so precisely. It was like sort of underlining a moment or, you know, being just, it just had that element of expressiveness. Um, and it was beautiful with, with um, Charlie Hayden, you know, and I filmed it so I knew there was a space behind him where I could hopefully inlay archive, which he was talking about, and all those sort of things worked. So I think I was lucky, but it's... Mm -hmm. it's um, and did, did Kit see the film? Yeah, and, and that, was, that was the most worrying moment because I promised Keith that he would see the film and approve of it. Not that he had actually any contractually... I mean, I, I didn't quite know, actually, if he had disapproved it, what quite contractually the situation would have been. Um, but Channel 4 suddenly brought forward the transmission of the film, so there was no way that Keith could see it before. before. So I had to send it to Keith, not telling him that it had been transmitted and sent it to him, and uh, then uh, a few days later, I had this phone call, it was Roseanne, not Keith, mm -hmm. and said, we've just been looking at the film, and I thought, oh, God, here we go, here we go, here we go, <laughs> and Keith loves it. <laughs> I thought, but you've got one problem, and I said, oh, God, what's that? I think you said that Alan Tam was in the wrong state. <laughs> <laughs> and that I just something in the commentary that I'd said that Alan either Keith I'd got Keith's birthplace wrong or something wrong. <laughs> anyway, it was the most redeemable problem you could have because you just voice over it again, and that was the great moment, you know. When, uh, and I thought, well, gosh, if Keith likes it, and he never sort of, I thought he. You never, you never met him again. Ne I never met him again. Hmm. Never met him again, um, and. Uh, and now he can't play. Mm -hmm. So, so it, but you wouldn't think, you'd think we were really quite good friends. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a warmth there, but it, it's, it's, it just worked for that day. Mm -hmm. but, but we went to, when he was in the south of France, with, where you just see those little bits of mm -hmm. Roseanne rushing around with the camera and mm -hmm. things like We were supposed to do some filming there, and I did do a film and interview there, mm -hmm. and it was horrible. Horrible. He was just as, just as somehow difficult and rather, but he was also rather critical of the musicians. He didn't want to be sort of very warm to anyone or anything. And um, I threw it away straight away. Mm -hmm. No use. But here you see him playing with many different people and uh, they, yeah. they, he gems with, with the others. Yeah, absolutely. And he looks as if he's enjoying it mm -hmm. and everybody does. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, well, a lot of stories, really. But uh, I remember one when uh, Kit Jarrett performed in Lisbon at the Coliseum in uh, 1980. He, he started to, to make uh, uh, requests about uh, the room, the Coliseum. And we had a, a sound amplification there, but he refused that. And he played acoustically. And uh, 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 the best was, uh, well, the whole was sold out. At that time, 4,000 people at that time. Now it's less, 3,000. But uh, 4,000 people uh, cracking the chairs, smoking, even smoking, and he stopped to play. He starts playing, and uh, suddenly he stops. And we ask to the people on stage, please uh, don't smoke, <laughs> don't move in the chairs. The chairs were 
very old, uh, the old Coliseum. Every Lisbon resident uh, <laughs> remembers that, I guess. And finally, he decided to come to the stage. And uh, he, he played totally improvised, totally improvised, along uh, one hour and a half, something like that. And uh, it was one of the most uh, amazing concerts I remember in my long life of <laughs> concerts. Uh, but he, he decided to, to stay here in Lisbon along seven days at uh, the old uh, Studio Sol Hotel uh, in the suite. And we had to pay the suite along <laughs> seven days. <laughs> so uh, uh, he was really a difficult person. I, I also know uh, his manager, uh, Steve Klaus, who appeared on the film. And uh, Stephen, uh, Steve Klaus is a beautiful person, but he is always advising the people who want to book it here at, at those times. Uh, that uh, he's not uh, an easy person. The last time Kicharet played in Portugal was at the Belém Cultural Center in Trio with Jack Jeanette and Gary Peacock, we saw in the film. The second time was that time I took part of the production team solo. And uh, the, first, the first time he played in Portugal, it was uh, in 1971 at the Cascais Jazz Festival. Precisely, we, with Miles Davis, and uh, we saw also images of, of that time uh, with the saxophonist uh, Gary Bartz and uh, others, Michael, um, the bass player, yes, those were the, the musicians. So Kicherit performed in Portugal three different times with Miles Davis with solo and uh, with his trio, Jack Dejanet and uh, uh, Gary Peacock. I also know very well, I knew I was friend of Charlie Hayden, a very good friend of mine. Uh, and uh, it's funny to, uh, to, see him, <laughs> to see him on the picture. Also, Drew Redman. I know a lot of musicians, naturally, personally, because I'm presenting them in, in Portugal. Uh, but uh, let me tell you that I enjoyed so much the film. The film is very well done. It's uh, a kind of a biopic of <laughs> Kicheret, more or less. And uh, I know his career, or, or his career, and uh, it's uh, a truly beautiful film. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think the thing I like also about it is it's, it tells you quite a lot about him, but it's not linear. You know, we go back in time. It's not, it's, it's not predictable. And it just You're moves. You're trying to find the groove. It, and <laughs> it's trying to find the moments when it's good to go from one thing to the other, and that's often surprising. And, I mean, the, the interesting thing, Keith, because I wanted him to play something classical, in, uh, certainly Bach, because he plays Bach a lot. And that was when he refused absolutely, when I first went to meet, meet him, to sit down and play any Bach. But we, I was given permission to film the um, sound check at the Festival Hall when they were there. And I just had my own little camera and a friend who was recording it sitting in the rows there. Um, and what was terrific is we started, and then Gary and Jack started playing the blues to each other. And in fact, sadly, I mean, they, that's quite a long sequence, because it's really enjoyable to listen to those two playing blues to each other. And then Keith arrived, and I thought, here we go. He's going to say, all right, all right, thanks very much, thanks, that's it. Mm -hmm. But no, he didn't. 
he let me stay filming. I mean, I filmed, you know, right up to him, like this, you know. And he sat down and played a little bit of the Goldberg Variations and another piece. And I think he realized he had to give me something of that Bach. And so he found a way of doing it spontaneously in the sound check, just when he was testing the pianos. So he wasn't doing it explicitly for me or telling me about it, but I did get the feeling that he was actually thinking, this is a moment when I can give something about the classical thing. And of course it was so perfect. Uh, I just had enough to be able to incorporate that into the earlier sequences. So that's the sort of way he kind of works. He sort of gave me something, um, but he wasn't going to say he was giving me something. <laughs> <laughs> And how did you have access to the archives? Were, were they uh, in different places? They were all in different places, research? and of course you have to pay for them. I mean, that's the trouble of these films. They are archive rich and archive, and we are actually poor. <laughs> I mean, we're documentary poor <laughs> buying archive rich, because they are people who got this stuff charge a lot for it. Mm. And so you can only, I think we've now got a license for another not a long license, but at least it's given the film another life. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and in the end, you know, people have downloaded it. It's there in the ether now, mm -hmm. because although you might not have technically the rights to play it on TV or something, people have downloaded the whole thing. And so it's going to be here forever, which I hope that's really. I'm glad it's very nice of you all to come, and I hope you've had an interesting evening and then uh, tomorrow we'll be here with two more films so in the morning at 11 uh, two films of your relation with john berger yeah, yeah. It, so the first episode of ways of seeing and then uh, and another episode yes. you made with john yeah that's right while. no a single film with john about time mm -hmm. but in which he's uh, anyway no, I'm so lucky to be able to sort of move along. I mean, it, truthfully, the last decades have been possible. None of the films are showing here at all. You could no more try and make Jet Keith now. You just wouldn't have got the support from anybody, any TV thing, to do it in that kind of way mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think I'm very lucky to have lived through the right decades in television, which allowed all sorts of possibilities. Um, which are gradually receding now, sadly. And and uh, and we will also screen in the afternoon your latest film that has just been screened for the yes. first time in in London, and uh, we will do the second yes, screening. Yes, well, you know, this is I'll just mention it because it's, it's a film called Painted with My Hair, as different from all this as you could imagine. Um, and it's about a guy who was in solitary confinement for 24 years in California. He developed a pen pal friendship with a friend of mine and they started writing to each other letters, 300 letters, probably. And then uh, this guy, Donny Johnson, felt a compulsion to become a painter, but he was not allowed painting materials so he had to make brushes from his hair and synthesize all his colors from the sugar coatings and the pigments from M&Ms and Skittles, which was the only thing he could get from the prison store. Because believe it or not, in solitary confinement in America, where as we speak, there are 60 or 70,000 men and women in solitary for months and often years, it is the cruelest and most extraordinary prison system I've ever encountered, amazing. Um, and uh, they don't even give craft materials to prisoners in solitary. Um, but Donny, and that's when my friend contacted me and said, look, I've, these paintings are amazing. And when I saw the paintings and read the letters, I thought, gosh, there's a film to be made. And it, but it's taken about seven or eight years for it to be finished. But it is finally, but it is an extraordinary film. He's now out of solitary and having a parole hearing in December the 14th, and we're praying and hoping that he might at least get out 
because he's been in prison since the age of 19 and he's now 62. And probably one of the most intelligent and thoughtful people and talented people. But the prison system refuses all thoughts of rehabilitation. It's almost not a concept. And all his achievements as a writer and a painter probably won't play much in the parole board hearing. It's amazing how creativity is so important towards rehabilitation for prisoners. And they do, and Tony is the most changed person, but he has a terrible childhood. I won't go on anymore, except to tell you that this is an extraordinarily unusual story. And, and uh, if you can come along and see it, and I say it not for me, but in a funny way, this guy, his achievements are absolutely astonishing. Uh, and uh, well, and it's the last film probably I will make because I'm reaching, no, we hope, age, we the, hope the, the reaching the age where you, <laughs> you don't hope. make you don't make many more. <laughs> no, um, we hope not. So yeah. we invite you all to come tomorrow for this uh, beautiful film. And it's called too. Painted with My Hair. Thank you, Mike. Thank you all. <laughs>